So the amount of content we're expected to learn in medical school is actually ridiculous. And so how do you actually remember all of the information and not get overwhelmed with how much there is to remember? So in this video, I'll be covering the top four techniques that have helped me remember what I actually learn in medical school. Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Abian. I'm a medical student studying in London. So the first technique is called the Feynman technique. Now, if you haven't heard of it, this is a term coined by an American physicist called Richard Feynman. And essentially the idea is that you should be able to explain your concept concepts to a 10 year old child, which means that you need to know the concepts well enough in order to be able to explain it down into such a basic level. This means you should be able to explain the concept without using jargon and in a way that a child understands. And the reason why this is useful is because it shows that you actually know the content well enough in order to be able to teach to others. Now, how do you actually do this if you don't have, you know, a 10 year old child lying around? Well, you can actually just do this by talking to yourself aloud, which is what I do. And I know, you know, it seems a bit odd if you haven't done it before, but by doing this, you'll figure out, oh, okay, this, this gap in your knowledge that you're actually quite not sure about, that way you can just Google it quickly to fill the gaps in your knowledge. Another way, if you don't have, you know, an environment or if you don't want to talk out aloud to yourself is just using a piece of paper and jotting down everything you know, as if you're teaching someone. And I'm sure if you found that if you've given teaching presentations before that you'll actually need to revisit the topic and make sure you understand it fully to anticipate questions. And the reason why this technique works so effectively is because a child will just have a blank slate. So they'll ask you questions about, you know, why this thing works or why is it that you're telling me this or why is this true? And it gets you to actually perform your own thinking from scratch to make sure you've understood the thing properly. The second technique is using mind maps. Now, if you haven't heard of Tony Buzan, he kind of made the idea of mind maps popular and he was even nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. Essentially, I watched a talk that he did in 2013 to like a learning conference where he told the entire audience to actually to tell him what's the first thing that comes to their mind when he says a particular word. So you can try exercise as well and that particular word was coconut and now for me as well I just pictured an image of a coconut and then I kind of thought about things I know about a coconut the definitions this that and the other but the point he was trying to illustrate is that our minds are very visual and if you've done this exercise too you might have pictured an image of a coconut in your mind and so the point he was trying to get across is that we kind of think quite visually and make connections between topics and different topics and that's exactly the premise of mind maps is that you take an idea and you connect it to other concepts, which is gonna be very useful if you're learning medicine because things in medicine aren't usually isolated topics. They usually connect with each other and connect with different topics. And so using mind maps is a very effective learning tool. So how do you actually do this in practice? Well, there's an app called My Notes on iPad, which you can just make mind map connections from. If not, you can literally just use paper or use GoodNotes and just draw out your thoughts. And since I've started doing this in certain concepts, it's helped me kind of think a bit more clearly and remember those concepts a bit more clearly. The next thing is practicing in person. Now there are so many practical skills in medicine, whether it's, you know, measuring blood pressure or taking an ABG or taking bloods, this, that and the other. Yes, there's a bit of theory involved, but in your exams, if you take OSCE exams and things, they test you on how to do that aspect practically. So the best way to learn those practical skills is to actually practice in person. Now, if you have clinical skill centers available, that's great. You can book the sessions and practice with the equipment there. But even if you don't, you can practice practice alone in your own room. And when I was doing, you know, examinations like cardiovascular examinations, respiratory examinations, abdominal examinations, I would literally be sat there or actually stood up next to my bed with a pillow, pretending the pillow is a patient and going through my steps, going through my introduction, going through my procedures, because that's exactly the way I'm going to perform it in the exam. And so that actually helps to build that muscle memory. And it's much more effective than just sitting down and thinking, okay, do I know this? Yes, yes. And going through the steps in your mind because when it comes to actually saying the things out loud there might be things that you are not quite sure how to phrase such as getting the patient to perform particular activities or there might be gaps in your knowledge about you know why this particular condition occurs so getting into that routine of practicing and building it into your muscle memory is a very good way to learn practical skills and what we also did while we were practicing OSCEs is we made a little OSCE group and practice on each other so someone being the examiner someone being the patient someone being the doctor 
and we took it in turns to actually practice different scenarios. That way it makes, you know, learning practical skills a bit more engaging and a bit more fun. The fourth thing is using Anki. Now Anki, if you haven't heard of it, is a flashcard app, which essentially gets you to answer a particular question and it's based off of either flashcards you've made yourself or flashcards you've downloaded from online. And the reason why it's so effective is it uses techniques called space repetition and active recall. So space repetition being that you test yourself in increasing intervals of time and active recall is a way to actually test yourself rather than just passively reading and passively absorbing the information. And you know, that's been found in studies to be a lot more effective than using passive methods of studying, such as just reading or highlighting or watching lectures. Now, it's a very fail-safe method. What I mean by this is, you only need to make your Anki cards good and all you have to do is do your due diligence by sitting down to do your Anki reviews daily. The rest of the grunt work of when to show you your cards, when Anki thinks you're likely to forget it, which cards to show you more often, which cards to show you less often, it's all done behind the scenes by the algorithm. So all you have to do is sit down and do your Anki review daily. And the benefit of it is that it works on your mobile or on your iPad or on your laptop. So even if you're commuting, if you're on the train, or if you walk to your placement, then you can still do your Anki reviews on the go. And it all syncs online to the cloud so there's nothing you need to worry about, about the data not being backed up. And by using this method of studying, it actually makes learning somewhat like a challenge, like a quiz, and it kind of adds that fun aspect to learning that you know may not have been there before if you're just using traditional methods of using notes and lectures and writing and reading and so on and so forth. And if you're new to Anki and want to get started on how to set it up and how to actually use it, I've made a video called Anki for Beginners, so check that out if you're interested. With that being said, thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you again in my next video.